CataractCoach.com. This punched out hole in the nucleus likely means that the phaco tip hit the posterior capsule. Let's watch this case here. So a normal rex is being done that looks very nice, about five millimeters, nice and round, very well centered. There's a uh, surgery that's being done by a novice surgeon with a senior doctor helping. So there's an initial groove in the nucleus, trying to split the nucleus. It looks like it's mostly apart. And now rotating the nucleus to do four quadrants. So it looks like a divide and conquer technique. So again, splitting the nucleus there, there's a good split. But is the split all the way through? Are the four quadrants fully separated? That's only about halfway. So at this point, the surgeon should rotate more and try to fully separate. But instead, watch carefully. We're going to try to bring a piece out of the capsule bag. High vacuum here. And that's the issue right there. You just saw it. This quadrant's not fully separated. And so attempting to use high vacuum like this and some phaco power holds the piece. There's the hole. Did you see that clear orange gap? That was the punched hole in the posterior capsule. So this piece of nucleus has been punched through and the posterior capsule has been hit in that quadrant. And what's the reason behind that? Because we had incomplete separation of the nuclear quadrants. And so despite using high vacuum, one quadrant was unable to be pulled out of the capsule bag. So the surgeon persisted, moved out, removed a different quadrant now one of the four quadrants is out, and then slowly but surely, the other four quadrants will be removed. Let's just fast forward through some of this. And again, at this point, the surgeon still probably doesn't know that the posterior capsule was ruptured. Using that high vacuum and going into the, a relatively soft nucleus and getting so close to the posterior capsule, that's a high-risk maneuver. And we learn later in our careers to avoid doing that. So here's a second or third quadrant being removed right here. That looks good. And that'll be removed without issue. Now, what are you going to do differently here? So I agree, we still have to get these pieces out of the eye. That small hole in the posterior capsule is still being blocked or tamponaded by that last nuclear quadrant. And there's that hole. At this point, when you see that hole in the nuclear piece, you know you likely have punctured the posterior capsule. That is the punch out hole sign. That hole punch means the phaco probe went through the cataract piece, through the nuclear piece, and almost certainly, bam, hit the posterior capsule. So don't let this piece fall back in the eye. Let's get it out of the eye here. So nicely, get a little bit of vacuum, hold that piece, but that big punched out hole, that's your danger sign. And if you roll back the video and rewind a little bit, you'll see that bright orange red reflex through that tiny hole as it was being punched out. So this last piece should be removed very cautiously. Do not sub chop it any further. Leave it as one big piece so that we can get it all out. We don't want any pieces to fall through. Now any changes in fluidics are gonna cause that small hole in the capsule to become bigger. So I like the chopper position, that looks good. There's the hole. We can see it just underneath the chopper there. So at this point, do not come out with the phaco probe. So you see this other hand, there's a third hand there's like the, the senior doctor who's teaching. So this is a great idea, keeping the phaco probe in the eye on position one to keep the anterior chamber pressurized. Do not pull out of the eye. If you pull out of the eye now and depressurize the anterior chamber, what will happen? A lot of vitreous will come forwards. So this is a good move, getting a dispersive viscoelastic in there to tamponade things, pressurize the anterior chamber, now you can come out. That was good. That was a good job. So what has to be done now? You know there's a hole in the posterior capsule. You still have to remove the lens cortex. At this point, I would encourage you just to use the bimanual anterior vitrectomy setup to do the removal of the cortex. Abandon the main incision, make two paracentesis incisions sufficient for the 23-gauge vitrectomy instruments, and use them. In this case, however, the surgeon is going to use a standard coaxial irrigation aspiration. You can do this as well. You do want to tamponade that hole 
that's already there in the posterior capsule and maybe remove other areas of cortex prior to removing the cortex that's near the ruptured posterior capsule. But again, it'd be really nice just to use the bimanual um, antrovitrectomy instruments. You can even use them on the cortex mode on your machine. You don't have to use an antrovitrectomy mode. If you use it on cortex mode, then it will not ever use the cutter. It will just act as a bimanual IA. So here, more viscoelastics going in the eye prior to removing the IA probe. That looks really good. And it looks like most of the lens cortex is, cortex is out. This looks pretty clean. It looks like a little bit extra viscoelastic. I like that idea. I always put in more viscoelastic. You know what I say, viscoelastic is cheaper than vitreous. Use as much viscoelastic as you want. So I like that idea there. There is quite a bit of cortex that still needs to be removed. Here at the end, the end of the case, the surgeons put a suture temporarily in the main incision. I like that idea. And now going in the eye with the anterior vitrectomy setup, nice small gauge through the paracentesis. Looks like just using the cutter in the one hand, I would also put an infusion in the other. Can you do the cutter via the pars plana? Of course. But certainly it's very reasonable to do it via the limbus, and most surgeons are going to choose to do it via the limbus. So very careful here as you remove any lens material and do any antrotrectomy, careful not to damage the remaining anterior capsular rim. We need that capsular rim to help support our sulcus IOL. So be very careful here. So cleaning this up, remove all of this material, and it just takes a little bit of time. So this is a surgeon having an infusion now, by manual infusion in the left hand, vitreous, uh, vitrectomy cutter in the right hand. So let's get that inside the eye a little bit more and clean this up. So again, this is an edited video. The original video was more than one hour. I edited it down to just the best salient teaching points. In addition, this surgeon has indicated when the video was submitted that he has done only about 20 cataracts to date. And this was done with a more senior doctor assisting him. So with that in, in mind, this is a very nice result. So cleaning up here and a remaining lens material. You can also get out most of the viscoelastic. Importantly, we need to get out any prolapsed vitreous. So being very careful, this is that one area where we know we have the opening in the posterior capsule. This is where a pars plane approach is advantageous because it pulls any prolapse vitreous back into the vitreous cavity. It pulls it posterior. When we come from above in this limbal approach, we're actually drawing any of the prolapse vitreous more anterior. You can actually go inside, put the tip a little deeper in the eye, inside that posterior capsule rupture. Now we can see how, ex how expanded that rupture became. So removing the lens material here, all the nuclear pieces were removed. Looks like the vast majority of the lens cortex fragments are also being removed. So keep in mind, this patient still may have a small bit of lens material that's retained in the vitreous cavity. So watch the patient very carefully in the post-op period. Dilate the patient quite nicely. Look in the retinal periphery. This patient, of course, is also at a high risk for retinal break as well as endophthalmitis. Remember, we can actually have a higher rate of endophthalmitis, macular edema, and retinal complications like break or detachment in an eye with a ruptured posterior capsule. So we have to watch these patients very carefully. There's more viscoelastic going in the eye to create a tamponade. I like that. That's a good move. Let's fast forward a little bit here. Here's now the insertion of the lens. Of course, a three-piece lens is going to be placed in the sulcus. You obviously cannot place a single-piece acrylic lens in the sulcus. So nice and easy. Let's see the delivery of the lens. First haptic is coming out. We all know that's the wrong orientation. What do we want? It should come out like a, a number seven. So let's rotate that over. That's the leading haptic. We don't want it in that orientation. Let's get it rotated. Let's get it rotated, doctor. There it is. That's a good job. Now it's rotated. Remember, 7L, the first haptic should come out like a number 7, and the trailing haptic should come out like a capital letter L, 7L. 
And when you look at the lens as a whole, it should certainly not be the letter S. And this orientation here is correct. That looks great. Now the lens, we need to get that centered up a little bit better. Thankfully, at the beginning of the case, there was a beautiful capsule rexus. So this would be an ideal case to get optic capture. So we'll have the haptics in the sulcus, and then we'll get the optic buttonhole and captured behind the anterior capsular rim. And that's going to give us a very stable, long-term solution to fixate this IOL. In addition, it creates a barrier effect so that there's less likely to have vitreous prolapse through there. So there it is in the sulcus. That looks beautiful. And then here's the, the optic. Looks like, are we going to push it through? Yes. So that's a nice result there. Buttonhole through there. That's very stable. That's going to be beautiful. And then uh, just repositioning it just a little bit, getting it into the ideal placement. And we look great here. In a case like this, do you need to do a peripheral iridotomy? No, you don't. With a posterior chamber lens, if it's in the sulcus completely, you don't need to. If Certainly, if you have optic capture like this, you don't need to either. What about lens power calculations? Well, technically, the optic is in the bag, correct? It's behind the posterior capsule. So we don't have to make too much adjustment. We certainly have to change from the three piece uh, to one piece lens to the three piece lens and that may be a change in a constant therefore a change in dioptric power of the lens but you don't have to use our rule of nines for decreasing lens power for sulcus placement because the optic in fact is sufficiently posterior in the eye and that looks great so important lessons learned in here and that most important lesson is if you see the whole punch sign in a piece of nucleus that's an important warning to you that in all likelihood, the posterior capsule was damaged. You punched a hole through the cataract piece and nailed the posterior capsule. And that's important to avoid that uh, one area. Here we go, putting a suture in. I do like the idea of putting a suture and sealing incisions. If you've had a complication, in almost every case, I'll tell you, put a suture in. It just makes your life a little bit less stressful. So here's suturing of the main incision, and then of course the other incisions have to be sealed as well. And this is a 10 nylon being used, which would be a great choice. The most important lesson, of course, was that hole punch, but why did it happen? Why did you get the hole punch? And the answer is insufficient separation of the four quadrants of the nucleus in the divide and conquer. So now the main incision sealed, now removal of viscoelastic and any prolapse vitreous, but I think we're pretty clear of vitreous, so cleaning up and aspirating out any of that. Here's some triamcinolone going inside the eye. Put just a small aliquot of the triamcinolone inside the eye. As we know, the triamcinolone stains the outside of the vitreous, so that's, that's plenty. It'll also have a very nice anti-inflammatory effect. So as we swirl the triamcinolone around, if there are big vitreous strands, we'll see those, and it looks pretty good, maybe a little bit to the right-hand paracentesis. We can put the cutter in there and aspirate if we need to, and maybe do a little vitreous cutting. But that looks fantastic. Again, watch the patient carefully in the post-op period, and now you have learned a very valuable lesson. When you see a patient like this, and you're doing your surgery, of course, we need to have great separation of our four quadrants, before we attempt to pull them out of the bag. Be very careful about using too much FACO power or vacuum trying to bring a piece out of the bag because you can inadvertently punch through it. And then learn to clean up the case and have a good result like this. And here's some um, sealant being used to make sure the incisions are sealed. And this patient has a very nice result and will have a good post-op outcome as well. So thank you for watching. I do appreciate it.